Goheen. Welcome back to Apollos Water. Thank you. Good to be here. Are you ready for the Fast Five? I guess as ready as I'm ever going to be for an old guy. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so you you go back and forth between Phoenix and Vancouver, but Phoenix is most known for this kind of food and why? Well, that's a... I'm probably not the right person to ask about this in a fast. Oh, that's five. right. You're not a foodie. I, I am the opposite of a foodie. Oh. I'll tell you one thing I love in Phoenix. I love a, a Texas barbecue. So that's crazy. It's a Texas barbecue in Phoenix. And you can't get that in Vancouver. Vancouver, it's British fish and chips. But in for me, oh. in Phoenix, it's Texas barbecue. Sorry about that. <laughs> Well, I, this is my other questions are going to be terrible. My second question, it's also a food question, but because you're Canadian, I want to know what the best kind of poutine is. Uh, I didn't know there are many kinds of poutines. You just caught me. There's um, poutineries. I, I, I learned about poutineries. I had okay. no idea there were many different well, kinds. Again, I'm not not being a foodie. Um, I've uh, I enjoy poutine. I just had it about a week ago before I came down here and enjoyed it, but. Are there many kinds? I suppose different cheeses, different kinds of uh, gravy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so poutine is not the best question. All right, how about this one? Since you're in Phoenix, what's the best part of leave, living in Phoenix? Because I'd like to know, considering you've had how many days of 100 degrees in the higher right yeah. now. My favorite thing about living in Phoenix, I, I do like the heat. So I'm the wrong, again, I'm the wrong guy to say it's bad to be hot. I like the heat. My wife does not. I love the heat. I love getting up every morning and jumping in my pool. <laughs> I, I like that kind of thing. But I guess what I like most about it is I, to be honest, it's the cohorts that I teach, 15 leaders, and they have become some of the most uh, nourishing small groups, if you can put it, that I've ever had in our academic environment. I, I love the people here. I love the people that are the leaders in the church. They are just wonderful. Mm, I like that. Well, how about this one? Since it is a little odd, by the way, that you like heat and you're from Canada, but I guess that does exist. So let me well, ask you this. Some people like heat because they are from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> that's true all right how about this one this i like to ask this one what people don't get about being canadian is what what don't they get well for me it's just about everything <laughs> <laughs> when i when i get down here i start to realize that we are americans and canadians are so different but the, the subtleties, and sometimes you start to realize, okay, I think they're hearing me, but I think they're hearing me through a different, uh, <laughs> higher, different, higher, different grid. Uh, but I think that, uh, I think Americans are much bolder and much more aggressive. Hmm. And I think that can be good and it can be bad. And I think that sometimes the approach of Canadians and not being aggressive and bold can be seen as being timid, as mm -hmm. uh, being uh, being too passive, um, being nice. Uh, mm -hmm. Canadians are nice. And I think they that's a misunderstanding of Canadians. Mm, OK, <laughs> I mean, I think the whole world would be surprised if Canada led a war just because that yeah. flag is not intimidating. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Uh, yeah, our, our yeah, we don't have any tanks, and if we did, we'd have three three gears in reverse and one. In <laughs> okay, number five. Now, this is a little different question. If you could pick one year to go back to in time, non biblical, can't be a biblical. What year would you go to, and why? Good question. I would love to go back and sit in on the discipleship programs of the early church under Irenaeus. Oh, I would, uh, to me, that model that Irenaeus has been using, uh, that, that Irenaeus, uh, spells out that has been, that was worked its way through the early church. That to me, in many ways defines what I'm trying to do here at MTC. And I see them, 
I see them doing that and I'd love to know how they did it. How is it that they were able to help new converts go through two years of this kind of rigorous discipleship? And how did they do it? How did they help them understand the biblical story? How did they help them understand the Western story? I mean, th that was critical that the, you have to understand the, the Western stories that are shaping you and you got to be you have to be detoxified from the idolatry of those stories. I'd like to see how they did that. I'd love to see their practices and how they did it. That'd be probably one of the times that comes to mind. They have two years of intense discipleship. Yep. Before and then on the final, on the end of two years, they would be uh, in on Easter. There would be a great baptism. And so those, you know, that that lengthy time period that was quite intense. The idea was you're you're going to get to know the biblical story. You're going to you, what you're and you're going to get to know the Roman story that's been shaping you. And what you're going to do is you're going where if you don't not only come to know these stories but start living in such a way that you look like jesus and are making the biblical story attractive to people you don't do that we don't baptize you i mean it was pretty it was it, there's a lot of stuff that's been uh that um i've appreciated that's been written recently on some of that whole catechetical process mm, i want to learn more what year is that about well irenaeus wrote his his in the uh, second century okay so yeah his yeah if you're interested uh the person that's written two or three books on this just died recently church historian named alan Kreider, k-r-e-i-d-e-r -E -E and he's the one that's really been showing that the the vision of that early church catechism involved the biblical story yes that's a, that's, it? that's it yeah. yeah, that's one of them. There's a, one or two other smaller books that um, I don't have the title right now, but smaller books that actually focus even more on some of this. But they're saying um, the, these catechisms are saying you got to live into the biblical story with Christ as the fulfillment. Uh, you've got to understand the Western culture and story that's been shaping you. And, and all this for the purpose of being good news, looking like Jesus for the sake of the world. Mm. I I have talked with other people. Um, Scott Sunquist talked a bit about this book and okay. I actually had it, but I keep hearing more and more people refer to it. So, I mean, of course he died, so I wouldn't be able to interview him, but I love the, I love what I've read so far in the book. And, and I think we need those type of counter cat, those catechesis methods that you talked about, which leads us to your book. I want to talk about the church and its vocation, Leslie Newbegin's Missionary Ecclesiology. Now, this is a book that most people are going to go, what are you talking about? I have no idea. So let's start a bit with learning about Leslie Newbegin. Who, first of all, who is he? And how did you get into Leslie Newbegin? The guy named Leslie. I mean, that's a little bit strange there, but. And, and with two, two S's. S's. With two S's too. It's like, what, what, where's he from? Anyway. Many, many scholars spell his name with one S and then put two G's in Newbegin. And. <laughs> He always wondered if they're compensating or something. But anyway, <laughs> um, who is he and how did I get into him are, good, are great questions. Here's how I got. I was teaching my first worldview course, and um, I asked a worldview scholar who had been teaching for years, what are you using? He was using his own book. Uh, as you might expect, he was using another fairly well-known book by Niebuhr called Christ and Culture. And then he's re and then he using this third book called um, Foolishness to the Greeks by Leslie Newbegin. And I said, what is that book? And who is Leslie Newbegin? Well, he, this came at the end of about seven years. I'd been a church planter. I planted the church and I was pastoring it. It was in a, the Toronto, Canada area, very neo-pagan. And I am trying to understand what it means to bring the gospel to this area. And then I read this book by Leslie Newbegin called Foolishness to the Greeks. I'd love to tell you more about this, but for the first 20 pages of that book, I read over and over and over again. And I was saying, this guy is onto something, and I don't know what it is, but he's onto something that is speaking to me as a church planter that is frustrated. I'm frustrated because I'm being offered a confessionalism that is conservative on the one side, it's wonderfully biblically, biblical and theological, but not relevant. 
and the church growth movement on the other side that's wonderfully relevant but not rooted in scripture and theology and i don't know a way forward other than balancing on both feet and here is someone that is bringing me into a new paradigm a new vision that's going to help me understand what i've been doing for seven years and so I'm reading these 20 pages over and over, trying to make sense of them. In the meantime, running down to my wife about every hour saying, you got to hear this. You got to hear this. This is resolving so many of my issues. You got to hear this. And I tried to figure out what he was doing. To make a long story short, I started realizing that here is a man that was one of the best known Christians of this time one of the best known authors. This is in the late eighties. I began church planning in the early eighties. I'm reading his book in the late eighties. And I'm starting to realize that this is one, that the books of this man are some of the best selling books going on, on right now. He's written two or three books that are exploding on the scene. And I realize I'm not the only one that this is happening to. I'm one of many that this is happening to. And so I find out who is this man? And I realize here's who he is in a nutshell. He's a fellow that has a long history uh, uh, in, in India. He's been 40 years a missionary in India. He's been a public figure for long through that period, but he's been a missionary in India for 40 years. He has now returned to England after 40 years. And he's now looking at, at England and the whole of Europe, and for that matter, the whole of Western culture through a new set of lenses. It's almost like his 40 years of experience has given him a new set of glasses to look at the culture in a missionary way. The way a missionary, when it goes to a Hindu or a Muslim or a Buddhist culture, um, and the way they have to understand how that culture deeply affects everything. Now he's coming back to a culture that is claiming to either be Christian or neutral. And he's realizing it's neither. What it is, is neo-pagan, it's deeply humanistic, and it is a religion that is just as dangerous, if not more so than Hinduism or Islam. And so he's coming back and he's with his new missionary eyes, he's asking huge questions about how the church is to live faithfully in that culture. And he writes an article that is an article that has become quite famous, where he says that the Western church is, quote, an advanced case of syncretism, an advanced case of syncretism. Now, what is syncretism? Syncretism, here, here's one of his stories. Syncretism is when he goes into a Hindu temple and that Hindu temple has many figures around the temple. And over here on this one side is a picture of Jesus with an altar before it, where on Christmas Day, you come before the altar of Jesus, offer food to him, and you pray and worship Jesus on that day, among many other gods. He said missionaries would recognize quickly that's not Christianity. That's not a foothold for Christ in Hindu culture. That's syncretism. Christ has been absorbed into the idolatry of Hindu culture. And he says he started to realize that this is exactly what was happening in the West. The West, because they thought the culture was neutral or Christian, had allowed the gospel and their lives to be absorbed syncretistically into the idolatry of humanist neo-pagan culture and so he mounts a challenge to that and starts writing books that start to expose the idolatrous roots and the way it's beginning to shape the western church and so here am i a young not quite 40 something i guess uh, uh pastor uh kind of turning towards the academy at the time toward it starting a PhD work, starting to say, oh my goodness, he's speaking my language. He is speaking what I have seen in the Toronto area. He is speaking to the exact things. And I'm starting to realize that this church growth movement is deeply syncretistic. And the, and the problem is with this, uh, is that with this uh, confessionalism, it's got great stuff from a contextualized past that's not speaking to the present. What I need is somehow to bring that tradition and the gospel forward into the present in a way that begins to challenge the syncretism of the Canadian church. So that was my exposure 
my work, my, my coming into New Begin. And he's using this language of a missionary encounter with culture. And I'm saying, what in the world is that? What is a missionary encounter with culture? And what he's saying is it's basically what a missionary does when he goes to Hindu culture and he realizes the categories he uses, the way he lives, all of it is being shaped by the idolatry of the culture. And somehow he's got to find a way forward that faithfully communicates the gospel, faithfully allows him to live the gospel in that culture and make the good news known without allowing it to fall prey to the idolatry of Western culture, uh, of Hindu culture. And so that really began a journey for me. The journey affected me deeply, very quick. Uh, just uh, I'll let, I know you want to get in here and ask some questions. So I'll, I'll stop in a moment. But here's the journey it started. I'm the end of the 80s. I'm into my PhD work. I'm realizing probably I, I, being a pastor is not my main vocation. I need to be in the academy. I'm into my doctoral dissertation. And I'm studying systematic theology, specifically the work of Herman Bobbink. And then I start to realize I don't want to study Western systematic theology. What I want to study is the, uh, I want to study missiology. I want to study theology from the standpoint of missiology, because this is where Newbegin has got his insights. He's got it from this long tradition of missiology that's been narrowed to a very small part of the theological curriculum. And I realize that this area of missiology has a lot to say to the church today, has a lot to say to the theological curriculum. And so I do something that, uh, Travis, if you do a PhD, don't you dare do this. What I did is I switched horses in midstream. I, I was finished all my doctoral classwork and orals in systematic theology. And I'm ready, to, I'm working on Bob Inc. And I realized, no, I wanna do missiology. And so I had to spend another 10 years studying missiology and reading all the uh, reading through the whole 20th century of missiology to get to know this era area. And I had to get to know Newbegin. I had to get to understand how he fit into this bigger story. And in doing that through those, it wasn't quite a decade, but a little less than a decade, I started, it started to reorient me. And then I was ready to write a dissertation on Leslie Newbegin. And so I almost got fired from my university because it took so long to get the PhD, but it wasn't because I was being slack or lazy. It was just that I had to get into this whole new area of study and I had to get into it from a different angle, not as someone who wanted to be a cross-cultural missionary in the colonial air in the colonial paradigm, but missiology that spoke powerfully to what we needed to hear today. So that's my origins in Leslie Newbegin. So with Newbegin, you, you write about his, though, missionary ecclesiology. You also talk about a missionary identity. So what does he mean by a missionary identity and a missionary ecclesiology? Yeah, good question. The, the, the problem with the word mission is it's not a biblical word. It's a theological word, and theological words are like suitcases. You pack a bunch of stuff into it, and then with that little one suitcase, you're able to communicate a lot quickly. And if you want to know what's in that suitcase, you got to unpack it. And the suitcase, mission suitcase, that's been used for many years has been the idea of going from the mission from home base to the mission field. It was first used in the 16th century. But the word mission is a theological word like Trinity, like Providence. They're not in the Bible, but they're trying to pack biblical stuff into it. So one word. And so when you start unpacking and you start saying, okay, mission is about cross-cultural missions in the colonial paradigm, you say, well, <laughs> that that's marginal um, if it's even faithful anymore in light of the colonial paradigm. And But I started realizing that there's a lot more, it was a very different suitcase for Newbegin and for many others. What they uh, so I start with a mission missionary encounter with culture, a church being faithful, not being syncretistically absorbed. So my next step back is, well, what's the church anyway? Hmm. And that's what Newbegin was talking about, a missional church. And what he meant by that is that the whole biblical story has a, a missional direction. Meaning by that, the Bible moves from one man to all the nations. It moves from Abraham to all the nations in the book of Revelation. And that missional direction of moving from one man 
through one nation, through the one man, Jesus, through the Jewish, the church in Jerusalem, out to the nations and using the community. God uses that community, Israel, then the church to accomplish his purposes, to bring the good news to the nations, that that is a missional direction. And the people of God have a missional vocation or identity, meaning what that they have a role to play in this story that god is restoring the blessing of creation in them but not only in them through them to the world mm -hmm. and so this missional identity is not simply doing evangelism or going overseas it's about being the true humanity that god intended human beings to be for the sake of the world so abe uh, basically god creates adam Adam thwarts God's purpose for the creation. God chooses Abraham, and he's going to form a new humanity out of the old humanity to be what Adamic humanity failed to be. And he begins to create this new humanity that will be what Adamic humanity failed to be, and that is going to be the people of God through the story. And they're to be that new humanity as God works in them, but not just for their own sake, but so that they can be a light to the nations, so that they their lives can be attractive before the nations. Deuteronomy 4 speaks, uh, where Moses speaks to Israel, says, now you're going into the land. And if you live out this Torah, this law that shapes you in a way of love and justice and wisdom, before the nations, they will ask the question, who is your God? Where is this law? Mm -hmm. And they'll be attracted to me as the living God. That's what missional is all about. But the problem with today, and I won't continue the story, is that now that people are not an ethnic people defined by politi political community, they're mm -hmm. now communities in every idolatrous nation of the world, whether that be India, whether that be the United States, Canada, Britain, Korea. And now they're called to be what Israel failed to be, the new humanity in every part of the world. And so their vocation is to be that new humanity. She said, this is God's purpose for humanity in the midst of the world. This is the new humanity that one day will inherit and populate the new earth. Don't you want to join us and become part of this new humanity? And only to the degree we're offering a new way of being human and inviting people into that, not allowing the idolatry of our culture to dehumanize us, only to that degree are we being faithful. So I realized that his whole concern for encountering the idols of culture was bound up with his view of a missionary church, a missional church being in their identity of being the new humanity, living into the story and calling others into it. So that's what that language would try to convey. You have mentioned numerous times the idolatries of a culture or a nation, and even in the church. What are some of the idolatries that you see, you referred to syncretism, that, uh, that we have combined in the American church? Being Canadian, coming in, seeing it, a little bit of an outsider's eyes, what are some of the idolatries that you see that are at work in the American church? In, if I go to the, the deepest level, the Canadian church is bound up in many of the same idolatries because we're part of a bigger Western civilization complex with the same idolatrous roots. On the other hand, it takes a different form. And in many ways, you can look at the different forms the way Europe, it's an older Western culture, the United States that was a culture formed during the Enlightenment, and then post-Enlightenment cultures like Canada, New Zealand, Australia, that have a different shape yet. But all of them have the same kind of idolatries, but have, um, have expressed them differently. So what idols then would I see in the United States, and many of them in Canada as well, but in the United States? Well, I think one of the major ones is freedom. The whole notion of liberalism in its old 19th century sense of the free autonomous individual that undergirds the whole shaping of American culture. I am free to be and do whatever I want. And that expresses itself on the, in the right wing and in the left wing. It's just a matter of what you're free to do and be whatever you want. And so I think freedom 
uh, the whole is, which I think that's misusing a biblical word. It's not freedom. A much better word is autonomy. Autonomy. Mm -hmm. I am a law unto myself. I don't have to be live under God's law. I'm a law to myself. My freedom is about the individual. You know, I was struck between the difference between Canada and the U.S. in the whole area of COVID. Mm. When COVID hit in the U.S. and Canada, I was in both countries. Canada, there was some still some sense of British common law of the common good. And Canadians kind of said, well, of course you do these things to take care of one another. This is part of what it means to live as community. Whereas there's this sense of individual autonomy. You can't tell me to wear a mask. You can't tell me to get these vaccines. You can't tell me to social distance. Now, whether there are good reasons or not behind those, what underlay it is the sense of autonomy. I can be what I want as an individual and no one's going to tell me what to do. So there's no sense of the common good. Not, mm -hmm. And so I think that freedom. I think secondly, I think the biggest, one of the biggest idols is uh, consumerism. We've lived for decades, for, for centuries now, by making the economy central to our culture, a growing economy. And uh, we've moved from a sort of a producing industrial society into one where the goods are now being consumed. Consumption has become more than a consumption of goods, it's become a consumption of experiences. And I think that we're now consuming everything from to from marriages to missions trips to worship and so consumption i think a consumerist worldview that begins to engulf everything in consumption is a huge idol um, in the west i think political ideologies are enormous i think the ideologies of the right and the left are idolatrous they're focusing and taking one aspect of public life whatever that might be and they're building whole stories and whole political visions around that without being able to listen to the other person. And so I think you've got the different political ideology of the right that are ripping apart American culture. Both of them are deeply idolatrous. I think uh, this would be part of the freedom, but I think we have made idols out of sexuality. This is what's led, I think, to a lot of the gender issues and the sexuality issues. I can make my body and I can do with my sexuality what I want. And I think all that has come from the sexual revolution of the past and making sex very much of an idol, not keeping it in its, in its place. Um, so I think in post-modernity, there's a number of idols at work there. Um, they rightly recognize that reason and technology are not going to build a better world. And I think it's led to a number of idolatrous movements that are showing themselves both in the woke movement and the Trumpist movement. Um, and I suppose um, I, if I if I could just think of one more, I mean, I could go on for a while, but technicism. I think technology is an enormous oh, okay. and 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 what and I think technology is is ruining our lives in all kinds of ways. And it's if it's not ruining it, at least we can say it's emptying it. And uh, we, I think we desperately need to ask how our cell phones and computers and social media, the, the way it's affecting us so deeply, we put our trust in technology a couple hundred years ago or 150 years ago to start building a better culture. And the way idolatry works is you put your trust in me, great, I'll give you some benefits and I'll own you very quickly. And technology has done just that. It's given us tremendous benefits but it's increasingly owning us as well. So I'd say technology is one of those idols as well. You and I share a, a same vision for that. We see the idolatries at work. And I know right now, many of our people are listening saying, what, what did you call an idol? How are, how are these things breaking down? I think you've given us a pretty good description. I think though, it's very difficult for many of our people in the churches to see that as an idolatry. How do we help people to see that's an idolatry when they're already divided so much and we know that we're going to be inundated with emails, possibly called to an account, maybe even fired if you're a pastor of a church, because you and I both know that's where the fights, where people will fight to the to the death to make these positions known. How do we help convince our people that these are idolatries and that they really have combined these ideas with the Christian faith and it's not the Christian faith? Yeah. Uh, I wish I had a silver bullet for you, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could just say, I, I wish I could say, here's how you do it. 
but but I, I, I so I'm just going to just say a few things. I'm say basically that is that is what I've been giving my life to, my whole academic life to. So that's a huge that would be a huge answer. But for many years, I taught in the university. I taught worldview studies, and in the worldview studies, I was trying to help students understand their idolatries, how it shaped, uh, affected their public life and vocation. So for me, one of the ways of doing it was opening up the meaning of the gospel, opening up the meaning of the biblical story. And it was then a lot of it was just helping them understand their story, helping them understand how the Western story had so deeply shaped us today. And a lot of them just said, we had no idea about the story and how we've been shaped by it. So a lot of it is just telling the story. That's what I used to do in the university. Um, now, in the last 12 years, I've been doing that with leaders and pastors and trying to help them wrestle through these issues. And what I do is I start, I just started a new uh, freshman group yesterday of leaders, um, or actually Tuesday. And what I did in there is I always start with the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, the gospel he proclaimed wasn't what a lot of Americans say it is. Already that's been syncretistically absorbed into individualism. Um, but the gospel that Jesus proclaims is good news. The kingdom of God has come. That is God's power to renew and heal the creation and all of human life is broken into history and the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That already begins to open eyes to these leaders that this gospel is much bigger than simply individual salvation in the future. It's about Christ ruling our lives now. Then secondly, I take them, spend a long time taking them through the biblical story and why it's so urgent. The biblical story is the shape of the Christian faith. And if you allow the Christian faith to become a set of ideas and beliefs, those beliefs are going to be absorbed into the powerful Western story and be carried along mm. by the stream of the Western story. And what you need is an equally comprehensive and powerful vision of the uh, of story and vision of the, of the Christian life to be able to counter and to walk upstream against that story. I mean, that was a view that that was a vision Newbegin had. And uh, that's a view that Abraham Kuyper had. Both of them said, how do we get a, a, a comprehensive vision to stand against this powerful cultural stream? Well, Newbegin said, and I believe it's the biblical story. It's the only way. If you don't have a story, your beliefs are going to get absorbed into this powerful cultural story. And then the third step from gospel to story, the third step is to help people see this is their missionary identity. What people, the people of God are not a religious institution catering to individuals to help them nurture their individual salvation for the future. The church is the community called to be the new humanity for the sake of the world, to live out the gospel in every area of their lives for the sake of the world. And then thirdly, and, and fourthly, rather, it's encountering the culture. And that's what most I would say most leaders would say that's the most revolutionary part. The first three gospel story and missional identity click in the fourth section. When I begin to talk a missionary encounter with culture, I take them through the Western story from the, the pre-Socratics right through till today. And as I take them through the story, I'm indicating at various points where our different beliefs have come from and why we, why they're now shaping us. And by the end of that first year, I know, I've heard it so many times, their heads are spinning and they're realizing, my goodness, I never understood our culture from that standpoint until all of a sudden our, my, that understanding that story has helped me see uh, what is there. And then the rest of the four years, to continue with this answering your question, the rest of the four years are then, okay, within that story, let me help you see where technicism, consumerism, liberalism, racism, sexual identity and uh, and gender, the problems with issues with gender, economism. Let's have, let me help you see where those come and how they're shaping the whole of life and what is creationally good about these things and what's idolatrously twisted about these things so we can seize and embrace what's good and say no to their cultural distortion. So it's a long process. There's no silver bullet, Travis. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's a 
long process of a deepening discipleship into the gospel, a deepening discipleship into the, in the story of the Bible, a deepening discipleship into our what it means to be the people of God, and a deepening discipleship into knowing our culture and its religious uh, core. So it's a long process, telling the story, wrestling with its individual, its, its religious core, and then seeing how that core has affected institutions and practices within culture, and then learning how to live within them. Oh, my, I just, I just spill out a whole agenda. You, you, that is like several classes, as you've already alluded to. And I know some people. Oh, no, it's no, it's no, it's not several classes. It's, it's years. About- it's a whole life of discipleship <laughs> to you move know, this deep. <laughs> <laughs> I know many of our people that are listening are still, their heads are still spinning by when you said it's not just an individualist salvation and getting into heaven, but getting really that heaven into you now, this yeah. idea. And I think it goes back, if we were to look at it biblically, just as one verse where Jesus comes preaching and teaching that preaching the gospel, the kingdom of God is at hand, but it, it says gospel there and the that's question is good. is what was he preaching if he hadn't died yet and that's where you get the understanding of the kingdom and the fact that the new testament talks about kingdoms so often it's something that many evangelicals have largely lost and it's affected so many different areas of our lives in our christian faith and like you said it's it's because of the western cultural story uh we've imbibed that speaking of that story what is that story for our people so that they might understand it? They're like, I've never heard this Western culture story. What are, what are you talking about here? What do you mean by, the, excuse me, long, the Western cultural story? How long do you want? Here? I want, just give it, give it. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is, I, I'm not sure where to start because if I start back in the pre-Socratics, we're going to be here for a while. If I start at the Enlightenment that has begun to deeply affect American culture, that's a good place to start because that's the place of a real conversion in many ways in Western culture. But the trouble is to understand that conversion, you got to know what's gone before and what led into it. So this is well, let, let me let me see if I can um, let me see if I can do it this way. Michael Polanyi has used an image, and he says that the explosion of Western culture is lighting the flame of Western pagan Greek humanism in the oxygen of the gospel. So you light this pagan humanism that came from the early Greeks in the the, uh, oxygen of the gospel. Now, he's talking about a late explosion But the reality is that it's been the gospel and it's been the pagan humanism of people like Plato and Aristotle that have formed a syncretistic alliance and shaped European culture. Now, I would love to talk about that, but I'm going to let that go. But as we move into the modern era, what begins to happen with the Renaissance and on into the scientific revolution, the enlightenment, is that humanism begins to separate itself, as it were, from the Christian faith, no longer forming this nice partnership. The way you might say it to children is there was a marriage of people that were incompatible through the Middle Ages, but now all of a sudden at the Renaissance, they start realizing they're incompatible and they start to push away. And so what we're talking about is secularism here. As mm-hmm. the humanist worldview starts to push itself away more and more from the gospel, it continues to be deeply shaped by the gospel. But now humanism is beginning to exert its freedom. It, and that paganism is going to become a neo-paganism by the time we reach the, reach the late 20th century. And so what happened between the Renaissance, where the Christian faith was still very strong and the and uh, with humanism, and the Enlightenment, when finally there is this conversion to humanism. What happened in between? Well, there's two main theses that historians talk about. First was in the scientific revolution that they were given a choice. And you're given a choice between the Christian faith and science. Either the Christian faith was true and the earth was at the center of the universe and so forth, or science was true. 
And more and more people rejected the Christian faith saying, we can see what we can see. Mm. And so that led to the diminishment of the Christian faith. But the second thing that was probably even more problematic was after the Reformation, there were all these religious wars. Calvinists were killing Lutherans. Lutherans were killing Catholics. Catholics were killing the Lutherans. Everybody was killing each other. And the thing is that everybody was killing the poor Anabaptists. And so what you've got is Europe being soaked with the blood of Christians. And you, have, you see people like Voltaire and people like Descartes saying, oh, if this is the Christian faith that holds culture together, we, we want to reject it because this is what it leads to. And so there's this growing rejection of the Christian faith because of what it, lead, it leads to this kind of hostility. And so in the next century of the Enlightenment, there is the conversion of Western culture to a humanist vision. That humanist vision holds on to a lot of Christian stuff, but now reshapes it. And that Enlightenment vision is we will build the new creation, but we're going to build it. God will not build it. And the way we are going to build it is by science coming to understand our world. And as we understand that world, we apply it to the world, first of all, through technology that enables us to control the non-human creation. And then we're able to control it by applying it to the social area, by forming economic and political and judicial and media systems shaped by science. And when we get an good economic system, let's say capitalism, and a good political system, let's say democracy, that's deeply shaped by science. Mm -hmm. And we are rigorous in making sure that scientific science undergirds those institutions will shape a society where we can build this better world. And so in many ways, the modern worldview that's controlled the United States and North America uh, for 200 years is a vision of science and technology building a better world and progressing to this better world. What are you seeing in the late 20th century? Beginning in the, well, I, I just like to say beginning in the 1960s, is you get a hippie generation. That was my generation. I used to actually have hair down to here. You'd never believe it. <laughs> but in that hippie generation, you had a whole generation of people growing up saying, this worldview is not working. Look what it's leading to. And you see this enormous revolution in the 60s that is saying this is not working. And this is the origins and the beginning of post-modernity that is saying that story didn't work. It's led to more uh, oppression, more injustice, more destruction of our world. And he says that that is not working. And in many ways, what you see in the United States back in this time is really polarization. Let's hold on to our humanist past. But of course, that's considered to be Christian. Let's hold on to our humanist past. And you see people saying, no, no, these godless liberals are saying that it's not working. You know, that, 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 that story, that history is not working. It's destroying our culture. And that's evolved. And we could talk about its evolution in the late 20th, early 21st century. But now you're in a situation where in many ways, you've got a culture that's at culture wars, precisely because that vision of life did not work. That vision of life that was embodied in the founding fathers of the United States, that enlightenment vision that's embodied in the founding fathers of the United States, it did not work. It wasn't a Christian vision. It was an enlightenment vision. And it did not work. And the fragmentation is, what do we do? How in the world, what, what do we do now in a culture where we see its failure? Well, that's probably way too general, probably raises all kinds of red flags. Um, but I think that uh, that has to be worked out concretely and showing that this is, we're in, we're in the midst, the way I like to put it, we're in the midst in our culture at this moment of the failure of idols. That idols, as my friend Chris Wright says, idols never fail to fail. Idols never fail to fail. And the good gift of science the good gift of technology, the good gift of economic freedom, the good gift of democratic visions of, 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 of uh, politics, the good understandings of justice that came from the, all that under all that um, is failing to deliver the new creation that we want to see. And so those gifts have become idols. 
And what idols do is they say, give your heart to me. And when you give me your heart, I will give you something in return because they're powers of creation, technology, science. They'll give you stuff. But soon as I give you some of these gifts from creation, I'll soon take over your heart and I will dominate you and I'll dehumanize you. That's the way idolatry works. And I think we're seeing so much of that in our culture today. How do you differentiate between Western culture? I mean, you've outlined the Western culture. We see the idolatries that are there, but yet so many people want Western culture because it brings some aspect of stability. And I keep thinking of, and, and forgive me if I get this wrong, it might've been Winston Churchill that said, democracy is the worst form of government until you think about all others. Yeah. It, 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 basically. So here we have the flawed aspect of Western culture, but yet we know the benefits that it brings to other people, especially we bring it to help food and shelter. And we want to be able to do that. Our system is better than many of theirs. That's if true. you just look at some of the, the results and how it's helping people flourish. So how do you differentiate between that being a, an idolatrous thing to the aspect of how it's been good for society? That's a good question. I think it's an important one because I think we need to love our culture. What we hate is the idolatry that twists it, but we love our culture. And in loving our culture, part of it is saying, what's good about it? And what's good about American culture? What's good about Canadian culture? What's good about European culture? And I want to say a lot. Mm. A lot is good about it. And why is it good? Well, a lot of it is because of what I call the salting influence of the Christian faith on Western culture. Mm. I think the salting influence of the Christian faith is very prominent. You know, I've been teaching worldview, and I think in the 19, late 1990s, maybe 2000, I was traveling a lot to the Ukraine and Eastern Europe. I remember giving a lecture in a number of universities over there. It was called Marxism, Capitalism, and the Gospel, Three Visions for Public Life. And as I did, um, I had been very critical of a very Western, Canadian especially, but North American vision of public life, of its idols. But what struck me about going to the Ukraine and one time being in part of the Russian part of the, of the Crimea was that um, in Russia, there had been a real, the humanism of Russia, communism, suppressed the Christian faith ruthlessly and in doing so had a degree of success and the evidence of what had taken place when you suppress the christian faith the loss of salting influence was everywhere i mean this place in the ukraine was a devastated place and i was able to say that in my lecture this is a devastated place because your story didn't work what that did for me in a good way was helped me see that in the United States and in Canada, there had not been a ruthless suppression of the Christian faith. There had just been this privatization, putting it over here in this small area. And I've been critical of that and still am. But the reality is you can't put Jesus over here. You can't say, we'd like you to stay there, Jesus. Jesus doesn't stay there. He spills over into public life. And the reality is that that um salting of, of god's work through christ in the spirit has had a tremendous shaping and salting effect on the united states and on canada on canada through religious freedom if you want if you want to put it that way and so through that churches uh, have been able to live and act and live out their faith in a variety of ways and in many ways it has brought a lot of good into our culture and so um, I want to talk about that. So I think that's the good side of it. I think the negative side of it is that um, we've developed the economic side of life very well. And that economic really delivers and offers a lot of good things and benefits of life. And people want those economic benefits. They want those, but they don't want the way that consumerism and the idolatry of the economy dehumanizes. They don't want that. They just want the benefits of it in many ways. But I, I want to stay with the positive. Often what they want is they see a culture and they say, okay, we like these things. And they don't realize a lot of these things have come because of the deep salting effect of the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And I think what we want to, I think what I want to do is I want to say, we don't be careful. We're going to lose that. 
We're going to lose it both with the far left and the right today. Both of them are threatening even what the salting effect of the gospel has brought us and moving towards a more neo-paganism. That deeply concerns me. When you mention the salting effect of Western civilization, I'm reminded of Glenn Scrivener's book, The Air We Breathe, as well as Vishal Mangalwadi's book, The Book That Made Your World, because both of them say that our Western civilization has largely been shaped by the Bible in that we have freedom, this idea of concept of freedom, and it's it's gone off the rails, like you said, with autonomy. Um, but technology, education, um, equality, all of these things come from the scriptures. He said, if you would have gone back to the Judeo-Christian world and said all men are created equal, they would have laughed at you. And we, we failed to see and understand that many of the different benefits that we're receiving today is because of that exact salting, as you're referring to there. I'm, I'm just trying to break it down to our people so they can understand it, because I, I know some of these are very high kind of mega or meta concepts for people, and they need ways to illustrate it. You mentioned the dehumanization of materialism. Can you just explain for a moment what that means for our so our people can really understand what this dehumanization is? Yeah. For example, I think that our economist culture is leading to a world where people are becoming workaholics and they're, they're becoming extremely busy. They're, what's happening is their lives are become so busy making money and pursuing things that it, it leaves little time for deep relationships. Marriages are breaking down. Parents don't spend the kind of deep quality time with their children. Uh, people, especially men, don't have deep friendships. So it breaks mm. down relationships. People are too busy to spend long times in prayer and the spirit, spiritual practices. It's affecting us physically because we're not spent. There's a whole book written by a family doctor that says our economistic culture is destroying our physical health. And it's destroying our physical health because we haven't got, we haven't even got time to spend an hour exercising psychologists interestingly are the people that are writing a lot about what consumerism is doing to us it's leading to incredible stress uh the happiness index that psychologists use have been going down since the 1950s people are less and less happy so i think that what it happens mm -hmm. at, at so many relational levels at what i'll call spiritual levels at um physical levels at psychological levels what's happening is we're we're not experiencing the fullness of human life that's coming because of an economistic culture uh, that is destroying us. I could, I mean, I think just there's so many things like that. And let me let me just give you an example that most of us would not have even thought about. I mean, this I hadn't thought about this, but this is a book. I think it's if I remember right, it's called the Harried Class. I, I'm, I'm forget the details now because I read it so long ago. But let's say from the 1950s till today, till the time it was written, houses have doubled in size. People have increased the number of things that they have, maybe twice as many or whatever. I forget all the statistics, but you get the picture. Many more things. Then what they basically say is, look at this. A bigger house, more goods. Think of the time you spend in cleaning your house. Think of the time you spend in laundering your clothes. Think of the time you spend in taking care of your technology and start to say, think of all the time you take in just taking care of the space and the goods you have. And it kind of breaks that down numerically and says, by the end, this is why we're so busy. We are using hours and hours every week, just tending to our backyards, tending to our technology, tending to our clothing, tending to all the things that we have to take care of that people didn't have to do back in the 1950s, 40s, and 30s. And so the point being, again, a consumer culture seems to enrich our world. He's talking about all these good things we get. And what it's saying is, okay, you might get be getting some good things, but let me just let me just show you having all these things is going to make you require, take a lot of time from you. And that time is not, is going to be taken away from somewhere. Maybe your marriage, maybe your family, maybe being part of family, maybe your prayer life, um, maybe participation in church, maybe in volunteer 
um, groups in small towns in the United States. It's so interesting that they used to carry a lot of the weight of a social kind of uh, networking and glue. And because of people's busyness, they're not doing things anymore. And a lot of that glue is causing the uh, causing towns to not have that kind of say social cohesion. So in other words, there's many ways, I think, in which we become dehumanized by an economistic world. The, is that book called The Harried Leisure Class by it, Stefan B. Linder? Yeah, I, I believe so, yes. Yeah, that's um, from 1970. Yeah. So that, that goes back a little bit. They're talking about that all the way back then, which is... And just imagine today. Imagine today how much, how many more goods we have. You know, I, I wonder, I'm, I'm going to wonder how many people had two cars back then. A lot of family have two cars today. Just think of the time and money it takes to keep your cars running. Mm, I don't want to think about it. I just, I, and I'll bet you they have about three, twice as many clothes now. I bet your houses are even bigger. I know that's what he's saying then is now multiplying. How do we though counteract that? Like even as you're talking about this, and we've talked a little bit about the book, but in a missionary ecclesiology, we're talking about how to be a distinct people of God to offer a better vision of humanity uh, to people. In the midst of this world, we know the effects of it, but breaking that habit and finding an alternative seems almost impossible. Like with my children, just to give an example. So my my um, kids, uh, I have a kid in college, one in high school, one in middle school and elementary school. We just decided every presidential election to be political and have a child. That's what we were going to do. So in that in that period of time, though, when my when my son was 12, he gets to middle school and all of his friends have cell phones. And so you don't want him to be left out. You don't really want him to have that powerful tool. And there's different ways you can do it and go about it. And I know many families employ a lot of different things. But when they get that tool, then they start utilizing that tool. And you realize you can't be do anything without it. I mean, now with the school systems, everything's dependent upon the Internet. All the communications are there. COVID has ensured that. Um, how do we then help back away from these other technologies when we become so dependent upon them? Well, what I appreciate about your questions, Travis, is you're asking the big, huge questions and you're looking for silver bullets on a podcast. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not looking for silver bullets. I'm I trying know, to help people break this down. Is what I know, and I, and I deeply appreciate that. And the thing is that you have to take each different aspect and start asking questions about, okay, l l let me back up to the general thing. I think one of the things we've not done well is in our churches discipled our kids and ourselves into a into a vision where we are unique holy people in the midst of the world so that our kids have a sense when they're in the school we're not like the other kids we're called to be uh, we're you know we're called to be i'm called in my school situation to be the people of god for the sake of my uh, of, of the world for the sake of my other the other uh, students and so i think that one of the things that has happened in north american culture is the church has not has not fostered the way the early church did fostered that sense of being a distinctive people in other words mm. we don't do what the other people do we don't do that because we recognize that 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 is idolatry i think that's one of the big step back things now when you say trying to break it down that I realize that does not solve your problem. If you do the best job possible and your local congregation does the best job possible and your son is a son or daughter, your son, son goes into that school and there's the pressure, there, there's incredible cultural pressures mm -hmm. and incredible cultural pressures. We are part of a system that is de-Christianizing us all the time. We're part, we're, we're woven into this system. And this is what was so beautiful about New Begin and the Missionary Vision is they recognized that this idolatry is not just out there. We are woven into the system and figuring out a way forward is not just whoop, extract myself. It doesn't work that way. It's trying to find ways to embrace the good in technology while at the same time reject its dehumanizing idolatrous effect on us. So you asked me that question. Here's the frustrating thing. I'm probably about 30 years older than you. I don't know. And my kids are probably about your age. I don't know how old you are. My kids are in their early 40s. 
So my kids growing up had a different set of technologies. And so I could tell my stories and everybody would yawn. Oh man, that was that back in the dark. But we had to wrestle with the technologies coming like email and internet and uh, MSN, <laughs> MSN texting, things like that that were way back. We had to wrestle with those things coming into our home. And we had to say, and one of the things we did was we took a thesis by Neil Postman in Technopoly. And that is every time you adopt a technology, either individually or uh, communally, culturally, it's going to give you something and it's going to take something away always. Mm. It's going to give you something and it's going to take something away. And he, what he did. And I think if you put it in the context of the gospel, you can do what he wants you to do even better. But what we do then is we say, what does it give us? What creational power has God put in technology and allowed us to what's enrich our lives? What has it given us? that's good. And what if we use it in other ways, how's it going to destroy us? Hmm. And I can tell you one of the things we did with our kids, I'm sorry, it's an old example, but when MSN well, com good. comes on, they started saying, what we're trying to do with MSN is use it to communicate, build friendships. So they decided to cut themselves off. My, my youngest daughter and five of her friends decided to cut themselves off from it for two weeks and see what happened. And they, what they found out was, that MSN is very good at spreading information quickly among friends and very bad at building deep relationships. So they said, let's stop using it for relational issues. Let's talk about to spread a lot of information quickly. Let's find other ways to communicate and talk. That was one of the decisions they made because they said this technology does this well and this badly. It doesn't build relationships, but spreads information quickly. And I think this kind of Christian analysis in light of the gospel, it says, what's the creational good? How is it dehumanizing is the way forward? And the problem is your family may be different than my family if, if I'm the same age as you and we have kids the same age and we're going to wrestle with it differently for different reasons. And we can't stand in judgment on one another. But what we have to do is wrestle together with this and ask questions of how, as a Christian community, do we ask this question, not only of technology, but our economic life? Um, how do we deal with our educational? I mean, our kids are being our kids are being deeply catechized every day of the week in our public, the public school. Um, Dewey, the father of modern education, said that quite explicitly. We're catechizing kids into a worldview. How do we deal with education, technology, consumerism, political ideologies, social media? They have to be these kinds of questions that say, what creational good is there? What is idolatry? Pray and wrestle together as families and churches and decide on things. And what it may mean is my son has got to have a phone for these reasons, but he doesn't have to have these things on his phone. Maybe we take those things off. Maybe they're used for texting and they're, they're used for, um, for phone calls and they're used in these ways with the family, with these ways with the friends. In other words, that's what we did with email when it came into the home. We said, how, what's a good, what's bad. And we set up and our kids were on board with us. If we want to be distinctively human here and not see this destroy us, what do we do? We set up various ways of use of email that could benefit uh, with us without destroying us. I'm not saying we did, did it perfectly and did it well, but we struggle with it. And I think that's what it means to be, have a missionary encounter with culture. That's good. I enjoy thinking through those things because there is that idea of being distinct in a weird way. You know, you think yeah. of the Duggars or the weird kid that in the 80s that, you know, had shoulder pads or didn't have, they, they were just weird, socially awkward kids because yeah. they yeah. were yeah. they were homeschooled. We're not talking about that type of awkwardness or, or mm -hmm. uniqueness. We're talking about being distinct. And it is in your practices and the spaces. I mean, the nation of Israel, of course, had the Sabbath. That made them very distinct in their period uh, at time set aside for certain practices. I want to change gears here for a moment. You talk, going back to the book for a moment, we're talking about missionary encounter. We're talking about missionary identity. We're talking about missionary ecclesiology. And you refer to modern church has become in many ways, in many places, irrelevant. Why is that? You've already 
talked about it a bit, but I'd like you to further, ref like you said, the social cohesion has been lost in many communities because they have so many different options. The church isn't serving that function any longer because we've really stripped it of some of its power. But what are some of the other ways that the church has become irrelevant in our modern culture? Become irrelevant? Yeah, irrelevant. Yeah. Well, here's a quote that comes from a non-Christian. Uh, he's an Australian. He's a sociologist. He studied the world global church just because he was interested in why the church in Africa and Latin America were growing so fast and why the church in Australia was shrinking so fast. And he says this. He says, the Western church has singularly failed in its one major task. And that is to pass along its foundation story to the next generation and bring it to bear on the contemporary issues of the day. That's a quote. That's, that's a more of a paraphrase. Who was that? Uh, what's that? What was his name? His name's John Carroll. Okay. John Carroll. And John Carroll, uh, I think it's called the Gnostic Jesus or something like that. I, I forget the exact title of the book, but the point he's making, and it's, it's kind of a side point, but the point he's making is the churches fail to show the comprehensive scope and vision of their faith that's given in their foundation story of the Bible. But he's saying, secondly, they failed to bring it to bear on the cultural issues of the day because they haven't had a comprehensive vision. They haven't brought it to bear on sexuality and gender, on racism, on political ideologies, on uh, on goods, on technology, on economy, on consumer life. And in so doing, they've left their the churches have left the people of the church and parents have left their kids without a way to navigate a distinctive way of living. And I think that is a critical thing that that uh, we've not uh, the uh, president, I think, of Eerdmans made this comment uh, a few years back. He said, during the time of COVID, he says, uh, we, we, we've we seen just the so many people leaving the church today. And he asked, what happened? And he says, because for 30 years before, I think it's more than that, but 30 years before, we've not been discipling. We've been, it's been about attracting individuals to a certain kind of worship on Sunday morning, throwing our weight into that we've not discipled ship discipled people into the biblical story into understanding the western story into living faithfully and our failure to disciple he said has hollowed the church out then he said when there were these three cultural pressures he describes three cultural pressures one's covid one's the trumpist and the wokest uh, polarization and the other is uh, the racist incidents that took place with Floyd. He says, these three things, they came in and the church had no way of knowing how to work with these things. And it just pushed on a church that was that had was empty and it just imploded. That's his vision. Um, but what that described for me is instead of being in a place where we're able to wrestle together with the what's what the right and the left have right and wrong about these things we're in a place where we just started fighting the fighting led to polarization the polarization led to many people leaving the church and the church's class because we weren't doing the kind of in-depth rich uh discipleship that we should have been doing and so um it seems to me that recapturing the importance of discipleship the way the early church did it is going to be critical for a church if it's going to take up the kind of dialogue I just described around technology. It's got to take pretty much more seriously its own faith and realize that its faith is not simply about going to church on Sunday, uh, having a worship experience, meeting Jesus on Sunday, and then going back and allowing yourself to be shaped again by all the powerful idolatrous forces of the world and being given no means and no equipping means to be able to deal with them. I hate to I hate to say this, Travis, but I forgot what question you asked. I know, <laughs> How I has the my, church become irrelevant? How are the churches become oh, yeah. irrelevant? So, so again, what he was saying is we didn't have a big vision. We weren't bringing it to bear on these issues. And what was happening, we were just being absorbed into the streams and the cultural streams of the way that our humanist culture was shaping it. So we were irrelevant in speaking into that. 
So because we focus on just the individual nature of salvation and the heaven aspect, we have missed the greater, I don't want to say periphery, but it, it, it's really, we, we've we seen, basically we got the, the tree and we lost the forest, if, if that's a good way to illustrate it. I mean, we focused on the individual nature of salvation because Christ come did come to seek and to save that which was lost. We know that. That's true. It's not that the gospel is less than our right. salvation, right? right. And I, I want to make sure people hear that as we talk about this, because it is there is this idea of evangelism, because some people are hearing this for the first time, and they're overwhelmed right now, and they're so confused, because they thought they knew what the gospel was, because they, they even Paul's summation in 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ came to save and, and sinners, and that's the basic part, you know, and but it's it's much more than that. It's it, there is a greater vision. The gospel is bigger than you imagined. It's not less, but it is bigger. And when we fail to understand the bigger, when we just focus on the narrow aspect of it, what ends up happening are people become collateral damage for discipleship, and they're not ready to handle the cultural forces that are there. That's right. I think there's two things here that I think are important to say. Number one, not only have we narrowed our view of the gospel. We've narrowed our view of sin as well. And um, mm -hmm. I would remember having a Latin American describing, he was writing a commentary on Ephesians. And, he, and in chapters two, verses one to three, he said, here was Paul's vision of evil. It was three things. Number one, it was our sinful nature. Second, it was the world in which the, in which uh, the, Prince of the power of the air was at work animating that world. And for Paul, the world was the world of idolatrous culture in this present evil age. So idolatrous culture. And thirdly, was the demonic power behind it. And he says, so consumerism is our greedy heart, but it's also setting up a whole culture around that idolatrous um, a vision of life and the demonic powers using that culture to hold us in their grip. So we need a bigger view of sin, he says, and his understanding was his, his analysis of the American church was that as long as we have that narrow view of sin, we're not going to see how these powers are deeply shaping us and we're not going to address them with the gospel the way Paul did. A second thing that I want to say is I'll stick with Ephesians because that comes in Ephesians 2. Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1 do the same thing. And here's what they do. They say this gospel in, in, in Ephesians, they talk about the uniting of heaven and earth in Jesus Christ. It's the gospels, the whole reconciliation of the creation. That's what's going to come at the end, says Paul. Mm -hmm. Now, in light of that gospel, Paul says, there's a community called to embody it. And then it's not until verse 13, where he says, and you were included in this by your faith in the gospel. Mm -hmm. So the individual dimension Paul for Paul was inclusion. And uh, we probably don't need a dictionary to understand that include means to become part of something bigger. And so the structure of Paul's thinking, I would argue, in Colossians and Ephesians, I think right through the New Testament, was the gospel is a gospel of the renewal of creation. It's, a, it's cosmic. Within that is a community that embodies it. And within that are individuals that are included in that new humanity that is part of the cosmic renewal. And so sort of a cosmic communal in personal or individual kind of, uh, of of movement, I think, is what you see in Paul. And so I don't want to take away from individual salvation one bit. Matter of fact, I want to say when you put it in its cosmic communal context, it's even more urgent. Mm. Repent and believe the good news, because if you do, you're going to be part of what God is doing. That's a it's big in terms of what God is doing, and you yourself will be renewed to become fully human. That's what the individualistic understanding of the gospel understands. What they don't understand is becoming fully human, is becoming part of a bigger, fuller new humanity that is embodying God's purpose as part of the bigger cosmic renewal. And that, as Paul says in Romans 8, the whole non-human creation is going to be incorporated into this renewal one day when God finishes his work and so i think when you talk cosmic and communal it intensifies 
the call of each person to repent, believe the good news, and start to live out of that good news day by day and be renewed in the whole of their lives. That's an incredible vision that I don't think very the, the people that I have interacted with, people of my tribe, this is this is and, and I've been in the church for a very long time. I mean, m- my entire life, really, but my adult life, I've been serving in ministry and I and I've served in churches and, and gone to seminaries. And this is such a concept where I stop and I go, how did we miss this? How, how did we get to this part? Because I thought I knew what the gospel was until someone one day challenged me about the kingdom. And it mm-hmm. made me stop and go, what is the kingdom? I, mm-hmm. I was in India and I was talking with T.V. Thomas and he had mentioned, I had asked him a question and he'd been in, at the very first Lausanne, he'd met Stott and Billy Graham. And I'd asked him a question. I said, what's the one doctrine that you see very overlooked in the church today? It's a forgotten doctrine. And he said, the kingdom. And I, I think that's so true. I want, I want to park on the kingdom just for a moment. What is the kingdom? And why is it so important for us to have a kingdom perspective as we talk about even a missionary ecclesiology, a church that has this missionary outlook or perspective? How do we, what, what, what role does the kingdom perspective play in that? I think the kingdom in a nutshell is God's reign and rule over the entire creation and all of human life. Now you might say, okay, that's a great start. But what does it mean when Jesus announces the good news that the kingdom has arrived? And I think what we have to say is, in creation, God is pictured, I believe, if you look at creation in its ancient Near Eastern context, Genesis 1, God is king ruling the creation. There is a traitorous act in Adam, his vice regent within the creation, and God and God's purpose to rule that creation is thwarted. God calls a community in Abraham to again live under his kingship. And the whole language of covenant, if you look at it in the ancient Near East, is about a king who makes a covenant with a people to live under his kingship. And so Israel is to be a covenant people living under the kingship of God. The trouble is, by the end of the biblical story, they're not doing that because the law, which is God's law of the king, was unable to form them to be that kind of people because Israel still shared in the old humanity. And so something had to be done to enable them to live under the lordship of their king. And so when Jesus comes, he's using the language of Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 40 that said God was going to come in power and he was going to re-exert his rule over the creation and save people to the ends of the earth. And when Jesus announces good news, the kingdom of God has come, he becomes this figure of Isaiah 52, 7 to 10. Mm -hmm. And this figure is announcing good news. God is coming back in power to save and to bring people under his renewing work. And so how can... This is a question that's been asked. How can Jesus announce good news? The kingdom has come when God's been king from Genesis 1. Mm. The answer is Jesus gives himself in Matthew 12. He says to the Pharisees, if I cast out demons by the power of God, the kingdom has come upon you. In other words, if God's power has broken into history, to renew God's kingship, to take hold of the hearts of human beings so they can live under that authority and live under that rule, then God's kingdom has come. So God's kingdom is his rule over all of human life and over the world, but it's breaking into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the power of the spirit. And what is happening is that power is saving people Galatians 1 4 from the old age, from the present evil age, rescuing them from that age, Colossians 1, transferring them into the kingdom of God, where now by the spirit they can live under the rule of God, knowing that one day when Christ returns, he's going to re-exert his rule over the entire creation with no opposition. But until then, the church are the people called to live under that rule of God in the power of the spirit, being saved from the present evil age for the sake of the world until Christ returns. So the kingdom of God, again, is God's rule, but you got to say more. It's the power of God breaking in to reestablish that rule over the over all of human life 
And it's those who repent and believe that then come under that rule again, as Paul says, transferred into the kingdom. Mm. There is so much that you've talked about today. And I mean, we've come kind of to the end of our time. And it's funny, we've talked about the book without even referring to the book. <laughs> because all of this stuff is in the book. Um, whether it's the the missionary encounter, the missionary ecclesiology, the missionary identity. I mean, we're talking about individual salvation, culture. I know some people are swimming, trying to figure out all of this different stuff. You were just a wealth of knowledge. I like to consider myself a fire hose of information. I think that you're a much bigger fire hose, maybe two or three fire hoses. Well, that's because that we're trying to there. do it in an hour. <laughs> usually, <laughs> usually I try to do this over four years with leaders. <laughs> as we do it in four years um we just started a new group and two people came back both of them leaders in the church and they came back and they said we're going through this four years again because we've just got started and we realize we've only scratched the surface and i think that they're right this is a long process um and if people are swimming that's good and hopefully they've heard resonances from scripture that will drive them back and say, okay, following Jesus is pretty serious business. Mm -hmm. It's serious enough that I better give my life to learning to what this is, learn what this is all about. The discipleship and spiritual practices to be formed this way is a long, difficult, but delightful process for the rest of my life. And um, a quick podcast with Apollos Water is not going to, water is not going to solve everything for me. It's just going to make me realize the length, the breadth, the depth, and the difficulty of the process that Christ calls me to. And Christ makes that quite clear in Luke, doesn't he? Want to follow me? You better give everything to me. And it's mm -hmm. going to be a, it's going to be a long journey. It's going to be a difficult journey. But you know what? It's going to be a blessed journey. It's going to be a journey where you find yourself renewed and healed and find the joy of what it means to be human. So are, are we in an easy uh, uh, sort of a... Um, a quick gratification culture willing to go into the depth of discipleship long term? I suspect many aren't. Um, but, but I suspect many are that are listening to this. And probably if they're listening to you, they're probably in that latter group. They're probably more serious about their faith, more serious about following Jesus. They don't want Jesus light. They don't mm. want kind of a, 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 a cheap, a cheap grace and a cheap gospel and a cheap faith. They're genuinely wanting to follow Christ. So hopefully this will stimulate them to think about what the breadth of what that might mean. Well, Mike, I want to thank you for coming back on the show. And we're going to have you again to talk about the missionary church. We need to get into that to talk. That's the book right after this one. Um, you wrote them kind of back to back with a little period of time in between. But both are highly recommended. I, I I really do recommend to people to check out the church and its vocation, Leslie Newbegin's Missionary Ecclesi Ecclesiology, and check out Newbegin. Newbegin is someone really worthy to read. I mean, some of the books, where would you tell them to start with Newbegin? What book would you have them start with? Foolishness to the Greeks? Um, I don't know. I just, a leader yesterday told me, he says, he start, he's one of the ones starting first year again. He said to me, I read foolishness of greeks in the first year he says it blew my mind but i didn't know what he was talking about in other words i knew he was on to something and he was saying something that was huge and it was starting to affect me i said but i didn't know he says after four years now i know what he's saying and i can't wait to read it again so foolishness to greeks is the thing i read but i was somebody in the midst of a doctoral program had a theological education a good theological education so uh, and I'd say gospel and plural society is even more difficult. Uh, so I wouldn't, I'm not, although at least the first, half, first third is. Uh, but those are the two major books by him, Foolishness the Greeks, Gospel and Plural Society. A little simpler book that blew open this whole thing. It's shorter, simpler, and maybe is the place to start is called The Other Side of 1984. It was the first book that sort of was his salvo. It was kind of the first book that was put out there that people were reading. There's so many funny stories about people reading it and letting their stakes burn while they read it because they got so into it and they couldn't believe what they're hearing. Well, that's how I got into gospel and plural society, but I'm sorry, but foolish as the Greeks, but that came that as well. And I said, so, yeah, I suppose those would be the three that would come first of all, um, mm. So if, if you're not ready for to tackle a, a more difficult book, the other side of 1984 is not a bad start. Mm. 
Well, Mike, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for talking about the book. God bless you and your ministry as you continue serving at the Missional Training Center, Mike. Thanks again. Thank you. Good to be here, Travis. Appreciate it.